hello. Welcome to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin. This is Lecture 10, XML Schema Continued. So tonight is about continuing our conversation from last week, which again was all about XML Schema and really fleshing out in a bit more detail simple types, complex types, and some of the features of XML Schema. But having had, I think, a lot of last week's background under your belts now, uh, a lot of what we do tonight I think should come easier if it was at all hard last time um, than it was the first time around. So with that said, a quick look back. So last week we looked at schema and then introduced project four. Project four structure, recall, is this. And ideally, and I say that knowing full well what ideally means, you have probably completed, say, this aspect of project four already. So in this coming week it remains to implement the notion of a cart. And by that I mean adding things and subtracting things, deleting things, and so forth. And then it's after next week's lecture that you can really focus on the rest of the project here. And I would say more strongly than last week that you probably do want to complete project four up until this point by next week because this right half of the screen will occupy you, I think, for those last seven days of the week. Okay, so with that warning in mind, it's fun, but it's not something you want to leave for the last minute. Uh, with that in mind. So we did a lot last time and we introduced a lot of the basic building blocks of XML schema. Why don't we start with our typical approach which is what was XML schema all about in a sentence or so? Okay, good. So it's a language for describing the types of elements and attributes that are allowed in an XML document. It defines the structure, sometimes the values that, it can appear, that can appear in that document. What's uh, an interesting difference between schema, someone else, and DTD, which we looked at a couple weeks ago now? Yeah. Good. So schema itself is written in XML, the upside of which is presumably for anyone who's implementing support for schema can use their already implemented XML parser. So that potentially has value. DTD, recall, was sort of its own syntax, even though it existed as long as XML has existed. What's another interesting difference between schema and DTD? Someone else, yeah. Yeah, so finer data, data types. You have 40 some odd data types, which we'll put in a quick hierarchy tonight. And in DTD, you really didn't have terribly many, and certainly you didn't have the precision that you have in languages like Java, right? There was no distinction made between numbers and uh, strings, but rather you had these more vague notions of an, a name token and an ID, and even those were somewhat limited in their features. What's one thing you can do in schema that you can't do in DTD? I'm sure there's dozens of valid answers here. Sorry? Ors. Ors, what do you mean? Yeah, so one example that I highlighted was that issue of determinism or non-determinism in DTD. Recall that our example in our conclusion to the DTD lecture had this very simple idea, which was that you wanted some element to have as children foobar and baz, but you didn't care about the order. Well, in DTD, you couldn't impose that kind of flexibility because uh, the content model we said was non-deterministic. And for our purposes, all that meant was there was just no way in DTD to express, give me any one of these three scenarios, foo bar baz, foo baz bar, baz foo bar, and so forth. But in schema, we certainly can do that. And do you recall the name of the schema element that allows us to have not a sequence of children, but rather all children in any order? Uh, group right, right track. We saw sequences last week. We saw choices. XSD choice. Sorry? It wasn't choice. Uh, any was literally any, so that wasn't quite right. Something that suggested all. Uh, not inclusive. We'll come back to that. That was a restriction, a facet of sorts. Well, let's, we'll see. We'll see this notion of all, perhaps, and hopefully a snicker will erupt at that point. So this tonight is more about just finishing up this conversation of DTD, and we'll see tidbits of, DT, of, sorry, of schema recurring even in the remaining weeks of the course, especially next week when we start to look at web services. Um, a sneak preview of web services. 
Recall that one of the amazing auto magical things about web services is that you can write some API. You can write a set of classes, say in Java, on your own system. And if you want to expose those classes, those methods to remote individuals, remote developers, you'll see next week that there exist tools, among which is Axis, which is an Apache tool that we'll use that will generate what's called a WSDL file, Web Services Description Language. That is simply an XML file that describes in sort of high level terms what methods you implement implemented and what types of inputs they take and what types of outputs they provide. And with that WSDL file, can you use that same tool, Axis, but on the other end of things as the other developer, or you can use other tools to automatically generate the Java code, the C-sharp code, the Perl code, whatever your language of choice is, assuming there exists support for it in tools, you can generate code that will automate the process of accessing that same set of methods via RPC or remote procedure calls, and all of this will be implemented underneath the hood as XML. The use of XML itself, not so terribly interesting, but it's the, what it allows us to do in terms of features that I think will be a fun exploration. And so we'll do a number of demos as well next week in that regard. And you'll see too in project four, if you haven't read ahead already, the whole idea of incorporating Amazon's web services, or rather e-commerce service into your own project four is about using Amazon's uh, web service API. PayPal offers something similar. Google offers web services these days. Any number of other large enterprises offer web services, so they really are kind of a neat and uh, upcoming thing. So here's those data types. We saw a long list before. Just to give you a sense of what these things look like, this is pulled from the schema recommendation itself. Just if you're curious to sort of get a sense of the hierarchy, these data types, again, are things that we'll be borrowing in other XML-based languages as well. Um, this, too, was pulled from the recommendation. If anything, it's simply a, perhaps a useful visual cue as to what um, attributes are possible when you're defining uh, schema elements. You've seen a number of these before, min occurs, max occurs, and so forth. Notice that the recommendation itself specifies, for instance, those default values. So really, this is a formal definition. It's certainly not something worth memorizing, but if you glance at it, it will at least perhaps serve as a sort of reminder as to what features are possible, and we'll flesh out a few more of these today. And the same slide for attributes is also excerpted from the first of the schema recommendations. And I say first of just because the schema recommendation is in three parts, not three different versions. Okay, so simple types and complex types. These were sort of the core of XML schema when it came to defining what attributes and what elements can or must look like. What did we mean if an element was of simple type? Sorry, I didn't have any children and no attributes. So an element was of simple type if it pretty much just had textual content as its single text node child. Can't have attributes. Meanwhile, and sort of in line with this logic, attributes have by definition what type? They too are simple because obviously they themselves can't have attributes nor can they have children. So it's nice that you can use the same terminology at least for these two different sort of features of an XML document. So these were, these, uh, this is a refresher perhaps on elements of an unrestricted simple types. And I'll elaborate on what I mean or don't mean by unrestricted here. But here's say a canonical declaration. If you want to declare an element to be of some name and some type, we saw things like this where the dot 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 refers to any number of the examples we had last time. Here's a couple of examples. So this is an element called name of simple type because all it has is textual content. Same for the year element. How do you declare such things as these? Well, we saw last week that there are any number of ways you can implement a lot of these schemas. Our concluding bookstore example hopefully hammered home the point that there are any number of ways to do this, sometimes equivalently sometimes by adding additional features to your definition, but here are perhaps the simplest way of defining these two particular instances. Attributes of unrestricted simple types, pretty much the same idea. If you want to define an attribute of a given name and a given type, we saw a similar canonical definition. If we have an instance of an XML fragment here, so a student element, a gender attribute equals male, and the guy's name is John Harvard, well, we might define that attribute simply as follows. Completely loose, it's just got to be a string, or even the empty string for that matter, but it at least does define what we mean by gender. Element attributes with default or fixed value. So recall we had this feature. We were able to specify not only a default value, but also a fixed value. So what does it mean if an attribute called country is defined in a schema as having a default value of US? What does that mean in real terms? <laughs> 
Well, not quite. So the answer was it, it can only be US. So that's actually jumping ahead to the fixed answer. What does it mean if it has a default value of US? Yeah, exactly. So if some element is defined as having an attribute called country, and that attribute just isn't present, well, then it will be assigned by the XML parser that's using this schema to validate the document, a value of quote unquote US in all caps. And in contrast, if the value is fixed, what does this mean in real terms? If an element is defined in the schema as having some attribute called country, what's the implication of this being in the schema? Sorry? It has to be US. So that attribute has to be there called country, and it has to have a value of quote unquote US, and if it doesn't, what's the result? It's an error of validation. So the document would be deemed to be invalid, and then in your parser, in JAXP, for instance, one of our error handler methods would be called. Fatal parsing error and so forth. The number um, that we saw a number of those in the past. Optional and required attributes. So what about this? Well, if you want to specify that eh, it's OK if a country is not even there, and you don't even want to give it a default value, or just say its use is optional, if you want to require that it is, in fact, there, use is simply required. Rather straightforward is that. Now what did we, so those were all unrestricted. We pretty much said that this thing is a string. This thing is maybe an integer. This thing is a decimal. This thing is a non-negative integer. All of those were of unrestricted types. But there is a way, even with simple types, to restrict your values to be, for instance, some subset of the values that might otherwise be implied by a more general data type. So we saw a few of these last time, right? Max exclusive and inclusive, I think. Min exclusive and min exclusive. I think we saw a glimpse of pattern last time. So essentially these facets, as they're called in the spec, allow you to specify that something is at the end of the day a simple type, but it's restricted by one of these facets, is what you would say. And this chart here is pulled from one of our favorite um, resources from the W3Schools website, just to summarize what's also in the recommendation. But it's nice that it gives you a sort of tabular form with a quick description of how these facets work. So what do we, how do we use these things? Well, suppose we've got some element called year. And what we care about really is the current uh, class of undergraduates, whose years of graduation might be this year, 2007, or up till 2010. Well, those are integers all of them, but if we only want to allow any one of these four values, we saw syntax last time like this. Somewhat verbose, but also very readable, I would say. If by contrast we wanted to use, for whatever reason, the exclusive facets, well, equivalent or different from this? Yeah, it's equivalent. It's just another way of solving that same problem. What about major? So if you wanted to actually specify that, yes, something's not only a string, but it's also one of a prescribed uh, value, well, you can do something like this. Specify that someone's major is, at the end of the day, a simple type, and it's an anonymous type, because we're not going to bother reusing any of this code. So it's a string based on a string, but it's restricted such that it can only be one of these enumerations, English, math, or physics. What about restricting by value in this way? What's the one fundamental difference between the after and the before? Just to reinforce a feature we discussed last time. Exactly. So in this way, are we defining not an anonymous type, but rather a named type? This time it's called majors. We're reusing that, the implication of which is we can simply organize our schema in whatever way aesthetically we please. We can reuse this data type, which might be useful as well. So this just hammers home the point of reusability. So now let's dive deeper into some of the more interesting things we ended on last time. So restricting by pattern, we'll suppose that this XML document, perhaps in the spirit of some of those uh, uh, short answers that you've had in the projects have been of the form of multiple choice. So the only values you want to allow are A, B, C, D. Well, how much you go about specifying that? Well, those things are all strings, but you only want to restrict it to one of these possible values. And those of you quite savvy with regular expressions will notice that this is sort of the bracketed approach, the character class. You can choose any one of these four values as a valid value for what's apparently called choice. How about this? In English, what is the element called initials required to look like? 
Perfect. Two or three capital letters. Again, we have these character classes. This denotes, for the unfamiliar, A through Z, as you might imagine. This denotes another choice of A through Z. This two denotes the same, but because of the question mark, it means that whole thing can appear zero or more, zero or one time. And you could use parentheses and achieve certainly different effects. But the initials, this notion of initials kind of fits most people's assumption of what we mean by someone's initials. How about this? Same type of restriction, again using patterns, but using some additional features here. Again, very much in the spirit of other languages' regular expressions. Gender, in this case, is ultimately a string, but it must match the pattern of being M-A-L-E or F-E-M-A-L-E. So male or female, and a password in this case must be of what form? Sorry? So it is of simple type, and what must it look like? Perfect. So it must be precisely eight alphanumeric characters. So two, if you're not familiar with character classes and patterns and other languages supporting regular expressions, you can simply put these ranges back to back. So this means lowercase a through z, or capital A through z, or zero through nine, and then the squiggly brackets specify that you have eight repetitions of that same character class. So that means eight alphanumeric um, characters. How about this? What is a product number type? OK, starts out with three uh, digits, integers, then followed by literally a hyphen, because it's not inside of those square brackets this time. So it's three numbers followed by a dash, followed by two capital letters, or the whole thing can just be seven digits. So arbitrary, perhaps, but nonetheless suggests how you can combine some of these basic building blocks. And this, too, is a feature you see in other languages as well. So generally speaking, just to formalize this as we did say for location paths a while back so that you can also just get a sense of what in fact is allowed in XML schema, here's some of the jargon we might throw at things and it sort of shows you what um, capabilities you're allowed in this language. So you might call this a branch and this makes sense if you think of the vertical bar as an or operator anyway. It's like if this direction, else go this direction. So this is one branch, that's another branch. Each of these might be called atoms where they're sort of the very basic building blocks of the regular expression. A quantifier is something like this that sort of qualifies exactly how many of these atoms you're allowed to consider. Um, we have other quantifiers there and there, and then the whole thing collectively is what we'd call just a regular expression. And if you're unfamiliar with regular expressions and don't feel that you're able to infer enough detail from these examples, simply just Google Perl regular expression, XML schema regular expression, and I'm sure you will get thousands of results these days. But it's all fairly straightforward, at least once you've got wrapped your mind around the basic syntax. There are neat shortcuts uh, that also exist in other languages. So in at we, we can discard some of the formal jargon like atom and so forth, but you can literally have values, as we've seen, like A, B, C, D, E, and so forth. You can parenthesize expressions, which we didn't really see this time, but that just lets you group things logically so that you can put a star, for instance, on the outside of a cluster of characters. You can have these special escape sequences, sort of shorthand notation for what you might otherwise do with those square brackets. This is short for a new line. This is for a literal question mark. Um, but then it gets more interesting. This is any digit. We saw this. This is anything that's not a digit, making the D uppercase. This is for any white space character. I believe you can flip this one as well in schema. Capital S would mean non-white space character. And then you have these character class expressions, which we defined earlier. And then you have these quantifiers, which can be of any of these forms. And the one things we didn't see is we saw this guy here, which specified how many you have, have to have, but you can also do this approach, ranges. So if you add a comma after that number, that means you're specifying a minimum number of occurrences, but no maximum. If you don't specify a comma, that's a coincidence of minimum and maximum. That is, they has to be fixed at this value, or you can specify two different values to actually provide a range of possible repetitions. Do the parentheses make a matching group? Do the parentheses make a matching group? They, I do not believe, do so, because you don't have the same level of control in terms of logic. 
So they're just used for grouping, not for matching. Other questions? Yeah? Question mark, mm -hmm. Sure. Question mark means, I'll toss this out to the crowd. Question mark denotes zero or one. Star is zero or more. And plus is one or more. And those two are borrowed from other languages. So if you understand those now, you'll understand them in other contexts as well. So white space seems to be sort of a perpetually either confounding problem or dare say interesting problem. So why not just offer a bit of detail here? It's a little smaller, this example, but these are three different approaches using XML schema to the treatment of white space. So recall that we did spend some time when we spoke about DTD on how to manage white space. And the question we deferred from lecture one up until that point was how do you make white space either significant or ignorable. And we realized in lecture eight, I believe, that you could do this by way of DTD. So essentially, if you specified in your DTD that the children of some element will ha uh, that, that the content model for some element was element only content, that is, PC data was not allowed, the implication for your parser was what with regard to white space? If an element's content model was element only. That is, no PC data was allowed. Right. The implication to the parser was that any white space character, any number of the five or so special white space characters we've seen, um, new line characters, carriage return tab, space bar, form feed, and so forth, they were by definition ignorable. But if you allowed for mixed character content or character content itself, well, then they were by definition significant because those are obviously included in the notion of parsed character data. So how do we control white space and can we do more with white space in schema? Well, the simplest approach perhaps with schema is to simply specify the following. If we've got some element called name, think of it as a person's name, a thing's name, it's going to be a simple type, so we're not dealing with anything with attributes or uh, structure. It's going to be restricted to a base of string, but I want to control the behavior of this string as follows using the white space facet, specifying that I want white space preserved. So as you might guess, what this means is that any white space inside of the name element is quite simply going to be preserved. It will be passed along to your SAX parser, it will be passed along to your DOM, and embedded in the tree, it will simply be preserved. But you have two alternative options in the schema, replace and collapse. So there's a lot of text on the screen, but literally every chunk is identical except for these three words. So if you specify that you want white space for some element to be uh, replaced, what that means is that any white space character that's not a space proper gets converted to a single space. So backslash n becomes spacebar. Backslash t becomes spacebar. Backslash r becomes spacebar. Backslash f becomes spacebar. Spacebar remains spacebar. So if you have enter, 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 what you have is four white spaces as the result because you're literally replacing each of those. If, though, you don't want to just replace these arbitrary numbers of white space with just equivalent spacebar characters, you can collapse the white space. And what that means, as in with other languages, if you have contiguous sequences of white space, they all get collapsed to just a single white space. So in other words, if you have around some word, the word foo, someone typed foo, enter, 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 enter four times, well, those four uh, new line characters first become white space characters, space bar, so four space characters, but then they get collapsed into just one. So you sort of have a progression here from top, middle, bottom as to how white space is handled. And that's all. Mm -hmm. Anywhere in the element. It's not like trimming. It's literally about collapsing any contiguous sequence of white space characters that exceed length one. Anywhere in the string. So that's all. This does leave the matter of removing uh, white space further to whatever language you're actually writing code in. So that you might still want to call a trim function or a string or replace function in whatever language you're using because it's not going to get rid of white space altogether necessarily. Depends on the it depends on the instance. All right, this one's kind of easy. Easier form of a password. What's the difference between top and bottom here? Quicks. 
Uh, sorry? Okay, bottom has a minimum and maximum, so a password can be any number of uh, any characters, so long as there's at least five and no more than eight. And the top just means that the length must be eight. So we have two facets here, the length facet, and then we have the min length and max length facets being used in conjunction with one another. All right, lists. So we've seen things like this. You can do things like this with DTD. I would say in the real world, it's not terribly common simply because it's sort of, at least in my estimation, sort of contrary to the spirit of XML in the first place, which is to sort of semantically tag each of the chunks of data in your file. But in this case, what we have here is the ability with schema nonetheless to have sort of a data set, an array, a linked list, however you want to think of it, all captured within the body of one element, separated by one or more white spaces. So it would still remain for your Java program, your Perl program, to actually parse the value of this node, splitting it on white space, exploding it using PHP jargon on white space. But you can nonetheless express this in schema. So if you wanted to specify that grades is ultimately of type non-negative integer, but it's a list thereof of zero or more instances, you can use the list element to specify as much. But there are other ways to do this. What might, so what would be an alternative and perhaps a straightforward way of changing this approach to something that doesn't just have this sort of semi-arbitrary white space separated list of values? What might you do instead that intuitively is cleaner in XML? Sorry? Commas? So I would say commas is in the same sort of ugly spirit since you'd still have to parse those commas out in your logic in your Java code. So separate tags, separate children. So we've got the grades element. Maybe we should flank each of those grades with open bracket grade, close bracket grade. That way, at least, we're getting back the data in sort of atomic form. And we don't have to parse it. Literally, our SACS event handler is going to be past the right value, or we can just grab the appropriate DOM node that we want. And we don't have to do any post-processing. What's, what's a disadvantage of taking that very reasonable approach? It's, it's just verbose, space, right? Just for each of these two three-digit letters, now you're adding open bracket G, R, A, D, E, close bracket, then the close tag as well. So there comes a point where it becomes really a designer's uh, decision. Do you want to spend space? Do you want to spend time? What's more important? And the more text that's serialized across a wire and the more important the speed of your application is, the more those questions sort of become interesting. It might be a more inelegant solution doing something like this arguably, but at the end of the day, if it's making your document half the size, that might in fact be a good thing. Then again, there's, there's interesting implications of actually semantically tagging your data. Um, there was a neat actual uh, research paper a while back, and this, doesn't, this isn't something you can just use off the shelf since you would have to sort of implement it yourself, but the argument of this particular paper was that, yes, XML is verbose, but consider the following. Apache logs pretty, for web servers pretty much just have line by line a record of all of the transactions on the web server, what image was requested, what HTML file was requested, and so forth. And they use their own syntax. A couple of different formats exist, the common log format and so forth. But essentially, you have white space, white space separated fields that say the date and time, the file name, the IP address, and so forth line by line by line by line, and thousands of lines in the typical web server file. Well, the interesting argument of this paper was that by increasing the size of the log file, by actually flanking each of those fields, so to speak, with XML tags that actually say that this is the time field, this is the IP address field, and so forth, by essentially bloating the file to have even more XML markup, they were then able to run the file through their own modified version of gzip and then make the resulting file smaller than it would have been had they simply run gzip on the original Apache log. The reason being, their modifications to gzip essentially took into account the XML in the file and leveraged the fact that there was similarity now in the file that was obvious not just to the humans, but to the computer. 
Right? A computer doesn't necessarily realize in reading a file line by line by line that just so happens that the first 12 characters are always a date format and the you know, middle uh, nine characters happen to be IP addresses sometimes and so forth. So that is to simply say there are some interesting implications, especially if you are particularly concerned with performance. There are interesting things you can do. So verboseness, or verbosity, as we concluded last week, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It depends on how you exploit it, if at all. Unions. So another one that allows you to take something that's ultimately of simple type, but do something that's a little more uh, flexible with it. So we can say here that the element called gene size is ultimately a simple type, but it's one of two simple types. It's the union of two possible simple types, one called size by number and the other called size by string. So size by number is simply defined in English as what? Yeah, so an int from 1 to 42, inclusive. By contrast, a size by string is quite specifically small, medium, or large. So all of these possible values are ultimately of simple type, but clearly ones of type string at the end of the day, ones of type number or decimal, however you want to view it, um, whatever the appropriate ancestor is, but it can be either or. So is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? I'll leave that for an at-home debate, but it's a feature that does exist. Okay, any questions on simple types? Now we move on to the more complex, the more expressive stuff. Okay, so here's where the name and nomenclature got kind of stupid. So we've just moved beyond simple types, so now we're at complex types that can be simple. So we have complex types that can be simple, elements only, mixed, or empty. Fortunately, we've seen these content models before. We talked about the same thing in the context of DTD. It's just unfortunate that complex things can also be simple. So with that said, if something's simple, it's just children, text only, but you can have attributes. That's sort of the value add, so to speak, of making something of complex type and using the syntax for complex types instead of simple types. Elements only content by contrast, doesn't have PC data as its children, but rather just has other elements, some number of children. Mixed content is obviously both, having elements and or PC content, and then empty, which has no children as the content model, but it can have attributes or no attributes, depending on your purposes. And we have some examples of each of these content models. So the basic canonical structure for something of complex type with simple content, just to put this on the screen, is as follows. The dot, dot, dots, just to note, fill in the blanks with whatever names and types you wish. But you can either have something that's complex type and simple content that's restricted to something or that extends something. And I don't think last time we focused so much on extension, but rather just restriction. So that's where One Direction will go now. So an element, we'll come back to that. So an element only content, by contrast, you just have children elements. No PC data is allowed. So the implication, presumably, is that white space is ignorable because you're not allowed to have any PC data as the children of, for instance, the student element. Um, and on one of these slides, just as an FYI, I fixed it in my version, but in your printouts, I think one of these slides says student and name for the corresponding tag, so just scratch that out if you would, if you notice that. So here's the definition of a student in English. What is a student required to look like? It's got to have a name and a year element and be slightly more precise. What's the cap? Yeah in that order. So that was sort of the basic definition of sequence and how many names and how many years can you have? Exactly one because for what technical reason? Perfect. So the default values for what two attributes? Minikers and max occurs. If not present, they're implied and that's why again on slide two or so tonight we had that um, basic definition of what an element looks like, and it just had all those default values and possible attributes. What about this one here? Uh, what is the difference here? Okay, so the difference here is now we're defining not the student, but a specific name. So, let's see, what was the purpose of this example? 
Oh, this is just to reinforce the previous example. So if you had trouble with the first one, here's another angle using different content. I, one of these can be deleted. Um, but a name is obviously the sequence of a first name followed by a last name. Makes all the more sense in this case, hopefully, that you would just have one first name or last name, though even that is arguable for some folks. So mixed content. Pretend that slide never happened. Mixed content. Here's sort of a, a weird example, but that embodies the intermingling of PC data and element data. More reasonable, I think, would be to consider an example like XHTML, where you might have inside of a paragraph tag a bunch of text, free-flowing text, but inside of that you might have some elements as well, the B tag for bold, the I tag for italics, and so forth. But here, too, is sort of a potentially interesting, if weird, way of achieving the same idea. It's tolerable with schema. This might define it. So here we have an element called letter. It's complex type. And so how do we capture the notion of a mixed content model? How do we allow for PC data? You don't specify that sharp symbol PC data as we did in DTD. You just say that mixed is true. By default, it is false. That's why we haven't been using it before. But it must be a sequence in this case of name followed by order ID followed by ship date. But intermingled in there can be any number of parsed characters. But notice that name, order ID, and ship date do appear top, middle, bottom in that same sequence as prescribed. Empty content, simple one. So empty content, this element's going to be called foo. It's of complex type because we want to allow attributes. So it's going to have an attribute of bar of type XSD string. Model groups. Again, just a bit of jargon. And then we'll come back, I think, to a demo in a moment. Actually, let's go ahead and take a look at, I don't believe I even printed this. Uh, did I print this for today? Yes, I did. So there's very few printouts of code today because we just have these three files. But let me just turn your attention for a moment to Sax Validator 3 which is quite similar to the previous incarnations of this thing. Recall that we've been using this Sax Validator program to essentially validate XML files in either DTD mode, so to speak, or XSD, schema mode. Well, the one thing that Sax Validator 3 does tonight, in contrast with the previous versions, is that very similar to our Sax demo from weeks ago now, it actually prints out pseudocode for the SAX events. The motivation being the very simple example among your printouts tonight, foo.xml, simply allows us to explore in a mechanical sense that implication of white space from a few slides ago. So I um, forgot to pull this up earlier. So this is a simple XML file. It's got a foo root element. Notice that I've specified this XSI prefix so I can specify a no namespace schema location, which was one of the mechanisms we looked at last week for associating a schema with an XML file. It looks like I'm associating it with the file called foo.xsd. The only interesting thing about this file is that there is white space in it. So there's clearly a new line character and then some white space or tab, uh, tab character before each of these lines. And the motivation here is going to be, quite simply, how can we use those three different white space controls to affect the appearance of this? And what, in just real terms, is the implication? Just so we can at least see it with a quick and dirty demo. Foo.xsd, meanwhile, looks, by default, in your printouts like this. It's pretty much a copy-paste from that snippet of code we had in the trio of examples before. Notice that the first version here is preserved, and notice, for whatever reason, this is a capital S here. So um, we're going to preserve all white space in this document. And again, as promised, this code is simply going to print out that pseudocode-like syntax for us. So I'm going to run this on foo.xml, but, but first with validation off altogether. If validation is off, the schema is going to be ignored, which means white space will be assumed to be significant or insignificant or rather significant or ignorable, to be consistent. The other one, significant. <laughs> when my face looks one way, it's the other answer. So significant, right? Because if you don't have a DTD, the parser is going to make no assumptions as to what you mean. It's just going to keep everything for safety's sake. So if we go ahead and run this thing, what we have now is literally, and again, I escaped the characters as we did with our Sax demo code a while back, all of the white space appears to be preserved. 
and it's written out in, the, again, the pseudocode-like language. So let's now turn on validation, and I do that, and you can read through the code to see how. It's just like last week. I'm specifying the mode, XSD, in this case. It's preserved by default, so ideally we're going to see pretty much the same thing, and we do. So nothing interesting really happens. So let's now go back to foo.xsd, and what were our other two options for this value? Yeah, collapse and replace. So let's look at replace first. So I'm going to save this. I don't need to recompile because it's just the schema file. But I'm going to rerun our Java code on that. And now notice, again, as promised, those white space characters simply get literally replaced with spacebar characters of questionable utility, frankly. But that's why the collapse option works as well. So let's make one final change before moving on to say that this shall be collapse. Save that. Rerun my code. And now we have what's perhaps a more reasonable approach, which is that all of that white space gets changed to just a single white space character. But there is something interesting going on here. What's perhaps, what maybe piques your interest or raises a question? So there's no white space in the beginning. Recall that the file looked like this. So what about before? When we had our original example, let's open up the XSD file again. Whoops. Uh, let's put this back to preserve. So when it was in preserve mode, notice that all of the white space was indeed preserved, including the leading white space, because notice uh, this is preceded still by new line tab. So we had that indentation. But when we change this now to collapse, Notice that it does collapse all of the white space. Whoops, not compiling anything. All of the white space, and in this case, also gets rid of the leading and the trailing. So actually, I might have misspoken earlier if I said that it doesn't also trim when it's in collapse mode, but it does collapse everything that leads up to the first real character and everything that trails it. The presumption being, most people, when they write XML documents, are constantly doing that enter tab just to keep things pretty printed. So they make the assumption that not only are you going to collapse that white space, you're just going to get rid of leading and trailing. So that ultimately is interesting. So here's a question. This, at the end of the day, seems to be just one big text node. Why are multiple sax events being fired? Because consider the implication, right? When you start coding with your own sax handlers, Again, perhaps in the real world, when you start coding against DOM, whether it's with JAXP or even JavaScript with AJAX and so forth, this could get annoying quickly. If you might have, for one contiguous sequence of parsed character data, multiple SACS events being fired. I mean, why? What, what, what causes me some consternation here, thinking as the developer who has to deal with this? Yeah, you have to start concatenating things if you want to sort of treat it as one whole sequence of text. I mean, consider SACS. This would be, this is calling the characters event three times. SACS is all about fire and forget, so to speak, but the implication here seems to be that eh, you can't really forget if you somehow want to be assembling these things, for instance, when building your DOM, right? Because out of the box, it sounds like if we were to go back and implement project one, how many text nodes might you give the element called foo as a child based on this sequence of SACS events? Probably three if we ran your code from project one right now on this same input, assuming that these same SACS events would be fired. That too is just sort of annoying, if nothing else, because at least the model that we've sort of come to think of XML or DOM as having is that if you've got some textual child, it is a child. It's not any number of children that just happen to be hanging off of as leaves some element. So the thing to bear in mind here, and we have actually seen this sort of predicament earlier, is that SACS makes no uh, promise as to how many SACS events might be fired for contiguous sequences of characters. In this case, the reason that Xerxes is firing these multiple events is because it's using what as sort of a terminator, so to speak, to decide when to fire the event. 
It's that discovery of some white space, the new line character, presumably, that's saying, you know what, that's enough. I'm going to fire off this event and then proceed further. So Xerxes is taking that upon itself to fire three separate events. It turns out, though, that if you use Xerxes Document Builder API, which you may have used in your own projects already or may have used in Project 1, by definition, when you get back a DOM, assuming you're using the DOM API and Xerxes, for instance, to build it, you get back what's called a normalized DOM. And a normalized DOM quite simply means that any, uh, any adjacent text nodes do get concatenated into one before you're allowed to touch the DOM. So in SACS, no such promise is made. But in DOM, you can make that assumption. And that's of huge help when you want to make assumptions as to where your data is in the document. So just an FYI that sort of come up as a side effect of this particular demonstration. Just to be clear, what's a normalized DOM? All the text nodes are each Good. So you can, it's a DOM in which all text nodes, if they're adjacent to each other, have just been merged into one text node. And that's a useful thing just programmatically. Okay, so in the interest of reusing code and such, Schema provides this feature of um, model groups. Um, or rather, sorry, wrong, I'm jumping ahead mentally. So we ha we've already seen this notion of model groups. We've talked about content models in the context of DTD, so this just slaps a piece of jargon on what we've been using now for last lecture in this. We've seen sequences, we've seen choice, and the spoiler to the question we began lecture with, how do you sort of say I want all of these elements, but in any order? All was simply XSD colon all. And we did see that last time as well. And that was our solution to the quick story we painted at the conclusion of our DTD lecture, which was how do you allow for a so-called non-deterministic content model, where everything's there, but in any possible order. So the sequence model. We've seen before, just to show you that, again, because sequence itself is an XSD element, it too can take on the min occurs value. So in this case here, what is the implication of having min occurs zero flanking sequence and not just the individual elements therein? Yeah, that's all. So a name can either have a sequence of first and last name children or neither. That's the only implication, because max occurs is by default 1. So that would be the alternative. In this case here, um, what does this add to our definition of name? This was the before. This is the after. Sorry? What's unbounded? Any what is you want? Nicknames, right? So first of all, we threw away that min occurs here. So we want this guy to have a first, last, uh, first and last name, and then at least one uh, and zero or more nicknames. So the implication here is that you know you might have David Malin as the first and last name respectively, and then you might have a nickname of Dave or Davy or whatever other variants you want to think of as possible nicknames. So again, just expanding, extending the previous definition of name. What about choice? Choice, simply specified sort of intuitively like a loop where you can make multiple passes potentially over this choice, each time plucking out one of your possible choices. In this case, in English, a product type or call had either zero or one or two or three of each of the following options. So again, this we decided last time is sort of a weird example, but just suggests exactly what kind of selectivity you can have. But we also added to the product type that notion of effective date by way of an attribute, which in this case was of type primitive date. What about this? The contribution here being the notion of nesting. What is a product type in this case? You know it's a tough crowd when you can hear the birds chirping instead of the students. So what's this? All right, I'll, I'll coax this along. So this is a product type. 
it's got a sequence of the following, right? I mean, we're getting to the point with schema where you can kind of just translate the elements to English. It's going to be a sequence of the following, a number that has to be there and it's an integer, and then followed by that same choice as before. So it's the same thing as before, but with the requirement that this product needs to have a number as its first child. Again, arbitrary in this case, but just shows you how you can now mingle the models, and it's nested in the, in the sense that inside of a sequence, you can have a choice. Inside of a choice, you might also have a sequence. But again, if you just sort of read it through um, intuitively, it rather does explain, hopefully, itself. And how about this? This just means that a name must look like what? It's got to have a first and last name. Do we care about the order? No, not at all. Why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll resume, finish this off, and we'll probably let out early tonight since it's a nice day. All right. So if I may, just three things remain. So one, I'll give a quick word on the final projects whose proposals just came in today. Two, we'll finish up some of the schema details. And three, we'll conclude with a quick chat on project four. So, the proposals all came in today. What I will go ahead and do, unless you have explicitly told me in your emails, as um, mentioned in the past, or you now email me separately and say, please don't post this on the website, I'll post the proposals on the website simply so that you can get a sense of what other folks are up to. Um, you can get a sense of what, um, uh, even additional ideas for your own project. If you see sort of directions people have gone in that you didn't even think of going in, that's fine. And just realize I'll provide you with some feedback over the next few days. Fairly minimal unless there's something of particular concern and I'll certainly field any questions that you included in the proposals. Do take care to remember the benchmarks now for the project. Pretty much it's not assumed that you'll begin the project until after project four is in. But after that point, there is the status report, which is really just a not so subtle way of making sure you remember that there's a final project and to the design and implementation uh, follow that the design document and then the documentation and implementation follow for which you pretty much have a month and then that's it no final exam nothing else beyond that uh, any questions on the project no okay uh, let's finish up with this then. So model groups, this is what I was getting at before. If you wanted to reuse code, schema allows you the ability to sort of prepackage a bunch of related things together and then deploy those without having to copy paste, for instance, those same lines. So we could define the notion of a group called person group and henceforth a person group will simply be a sequence of first name, last name, birthday. I can now reuse that definition elsewhere. So I can define down here an element called name uh, an element called person that's of type person info. It just so happens that person info is a complex type that is a sequence of a person group. So do a mental copy paste now of these three things there, followed by a country. So essentially we're extending the definition effectively of person group by adding this notion of country. Is there a default value for that? Um, you would effectively assume that it's, it's a good question. Let me just tease apart the implications for a moment. Um, so by definition, it's going to be complex because you would only use these in complex scenarios because by definition, we're talking about uh, co content groups, model groups, which themselves imply children. So which implies, in turn, complexity, as opposed to simple types, recall, which were no attributes and no children. Here, because think of it in this sense. Think of it literally as a copy-paste. So what's person group is essentially these lines here. So that's being substituted right here. And so you already have the presumption that you're inside the context of a complex type. And notice here we see an implicit nesting effectively, and it's perfectly valid if sort of meaningless to put a sequence within a sequence. But that's in fact what's happening here. But it has no real implication since it's still in the order prescribed. Attribute group, same thing. And this perhaps is a more useful feature of clustering because it's more typical, dare say, that you have multiple 
elements sharing a common subset of attributes. And so in this way, can we say that a person attribute group is going to be a sequence, uh, is going to be a collection of first name, last name, birthday attributes. The order does not matter for attributes. Um, because recall, after all, your parser doesn't necessarily even regard the order of attributes. They just have to be there or not be there, depending on the schema's definition. The person, meanwhile, is a complex type because it's about to have attributes. What attributes? A, co a copy-paste of those three up there. Extending simple types. So here we have... Here we have the notion of a size, and size at the end of the day is going to be a string, but it's going to be restricted to just be small, medium, large. So we've seen something like that before. Well, what about genes now in turn? So genes, and notice that we're, going, we're extending in the sense that we're taking an existing definition, which we just did, and extending it somehow as follows. Genes are going to have a simple content model whereby they are the type called genes is based on the type called size. But we're going to add the attribute called sex, which is either going to be male or female. So there's a bunch of nesting going on here. But essentially what this is doing is allowing us to impose a sort of inheritance model, whereby we're now defining a definition, a type called genes that is going to be of type size, but we're going to augment that definition with the additional attribute of sex, which we just so happen in line to restrict to male and female as possible string values. So whereas before, we've pretty much been saying, you know what, this data type at the end of the day is going to be a string, but I'm going to hone in on maybe just the values 2007 to 2010. Now we're saying this thing at the end of the day is going to be a size, but we're going to extend it somewhat to also include perhaps other elements, but in this case, other attributes. That's all. Complex types. <coughs> so again, simple, con simple types have no children and they have no attributes. And that's why in this case, the top example, whoops, the top example was simple, but the bottom example is complex because the whole reason for extending this thing in the first place was to add that attribute. Hence the dichotomy. In this case, we can also extend a complex type. So if we have that crazy thing called, or in this case, just something called product type, that's a sequence of a number followed by name, but that number is of type prod number type, whatever that is, notice now that we're going to define something called shirt type, which has complex content, not just simple content, so to speak, that is extending product type, which is up there, how is it extending it? It's extending it by adding the choice of the following additional children, size and color, which in turn are of type, size type, and color type. And I wouldn't fret, certainly for our purposes in the course, don't fret so much over remembering, for instance, the syntax of doing so. But if anything, I would say the interesting takeaway is just that you can do things like this. Again, we emphasized in the beginning of last time's lecture the notion of inheritance and the flexibility that schema allows you that DTD did not. And this perhaps is just capturing some of that flexibility. So tuck away at least the feature, not necessarily some of this syntax. What about any elements to round out this notion of complex types? Well, this element's called name. It's a complex type because it's a sequence of the following children. First name followed by last name followed by whatever. So in some situations, you might very well want to sort of turn a blind eye to any of the additional data there for a variety of reasons. One might just be you care about first name and last name there, but your partner that's feeding you this data set also sometimes includes other data. You don't care about it. It's not relevant to you. You certainly don't want to waste 10 minutes of your life documenting exactly what data this guy's feed actually includes if it's not even interesting to you anyway. So you can just kind of wave your hand at the detail with XSD any. Is it lazy? Perhaps. Is it appropriate? Perhaps. Again, it's a feature to be deployed at one's discretion. XSD any. But the implication here is that how many elements can you have? Zero, uh, zero or one. If we actually wanted to say, you know what, my partner can put any number of elements, we've got to change max occurs from one, the default, to unbounded. So bear that in mind. Same thing with attributes. If you just care about some minimal um, 
if you just care that a name, for instance, has a first and last name child, but eh, you don't really care if it also has an attribute. Maybe this, maybe this element name sometimes comes to you with an ID attribute. Maybe sometimes it doesn't. How do you accommodate that? You could do this approach here. This would too. A min occurs, max occurs still applies. So in this case, we're just tolerating one or um, actually an attribute. In this case, yeah, so we're expecting some attributes, any attributes. But similarly, could we impose the idea of zero or unbounded if we wanted to be more flexible, more accommodating? So substitutes, again, one additional feature. Don't focus so much on syntax, even though it's consistent with everything else we've seen, but just the takeaway is the feature. Suppose that, and this was, I forget if, was this my example? This was from, I think this was from W3 schools. I might have changed the language example just to be Italian. So John Smith, in this case, is a customer, and his name in turn is tagged with the name tag. So suppose that John sometimes goes by Giovanni Smith, He's a cliente in this case, and his nome is as such. So how do we sort of allow for this? And I won't even bother sort of weaving a tale as to why you might want to do this, but you can come up with, um, it exists in the spec because there are cases in which this might prove useful. You can define the name, first of all, to be a string, but you can also define nome to be of substitution group name. That essentially makes nome synonymous with name. That's all. So they sort of share the definition. Meanwhile, customer info, cust info, is a sequence of names. But notice we're using this reference syntax, which we did use last week, which just allows you to define that element outside of the context. So it just is sort of a literally a reference there too. And then we define down here that a customer is of type cust info. That's familiar syntax. And then down here, we simply specify that cliente is a synonym essentially for customer. What this means is that when you parse a document that expects a name, this will tolerate the presence of a, or rather, when you have a document that, ex when you're parsing a document that's expected to have a customer, this will tolerate the presence of a cliente instead with the structure as follows. So that's literally uh, what it's doing, and it, it's, impose it's allowing for synonyms effectively so long as they're defined as such. And again, I'll emphasize that the W3 Schools uh, website for schema in particular is a wonderful reference. Um, it's useful going to the W3C's recommendations for definitive answers perhaps, but certainly for learning this stuff, bootstrapping your own knowledge, looking things up. This is a much more straightforward resource. And what you have here are screenshots of a couple of the tables that are there just to suggest that with hyperlinks you can really navigate a lot of the ideas that we've sort of wrapped up in a number of examples here. Questions on schema? We'll turn our attention to project four for a moment. So project four, and this is perhaps a, um, this first is a teaser as to what awaits you in project four. Um, so next time is all about web services, SOAP, and WSDL, which I gave a quick overview of earlier. And it actually is fun stuff. And of all the things that is sort of currently sexy about XML, web services, I would say, is certainly one of them, Ajax being another one, even more popular one right now. Um, this is one of your little Easter eggs in Project 4. What you'll do in Project 4 when it comes to web services is, again, not only allow your own user to check out, so to speak, and have their order fulfilled, so to speak, by your own warehouse, well, that transaction from Scamazon to your so-called warehouse will happen by way of web services. For convenience, your warehouse and Scamazon are both going to be running in your same instance of Tomcat simply so that you're not required to have multiple terminal windows running the same software, essentially. So we're going to run them both in the same instance of Tomcat. But the code is designed in a way that it would be trivial to literally move the warehouse to another server, another instance of Tomcat, another computer altogether. Again, for convenience, we keep them the same. And so what's literally happening here is not a direct method call from Scamazon to the warehouse, but literally a remote procedure call. It just so happens that it effectively goes out on the loopback Ethernet interface. So what's happening here ultimately is going to be transmission of a XML fragment that's a PO element. And what's going to come back is a PO acknowledgment. It's going to be the warehouse that does the processing of the input and per, uh, outputs that output. And then your cart servlet or some other servlet or JSP that you've developed will actually present 
the results to the user saying, we fulfilled all of your order, we fulfilled most of your order, but this stuff was back ordered, here's a receipt for it in PDF form and so forth, but we'll tease apart a lot of the inner workings of that warehouse next week. Um, so far as section for tonight goes, what I think we'll do is conclude here in a moment, and we'll do, since we have the room for a while, do casual Q&A, but for the most part, our code walkthrough and overview last week um, took us as far as we can go in terms of new knowledge, so what we'll do after next week's lecture, if you'd like, is a sit down and walk through some of the web service specific stuff of Project 4. Any questions, though, in the meantime? Well, it's a beautiful day. Hope you enjoy your evening, and I'll turn off our tape now and stick around and answer questions on Project 4. See you next week.